chapter 4 and verse 38. Luke chapter 4 and verse 38. If you'd like to use a church Bible, they're available at the back. It'll also be on the screen, but it's really good to actually follow in a physical Bible so you can turn up and look at other references also. Let's hear God's Word. Let's hear God's Word. And he, that is Jesus, arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him, and came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you for your word that shows us him in his goodness, his compassion, his authority. And we pray, Father, today, as we look at this passage together, that you would truly show us Jesus. Father, reveal him to us, we pray, for your glory and in his name. Amen. Now, last week... We saw in the previous passage that Jesus has authority. And in particular, we saw his authority in teaching, authority in the word, and his authority over the powers of darkness. In this passage, we see his authority over sickness. And again, his authority over demons. So Jesus is being shown to us in these introductory chapters of Luke. This is who he is. He's the one that was promised. He's the one who has the supreme authority. And Luke is recounting these events, laying down the evidence for us that there's no one like Jesus. There's no one else who will save you. There is no one else who is sufficient to bring forgiveness. There is no one else who can take you to eternity where there will be no more sickness or disease and the demons will be cast away forever. But until that day, we walk with Jesus on this earth. I mean, to know that he has authority over everything. But there's something else and this passage particularly shows us. He doesn't just have authority. He is full of compassion. He is a compassionate saviour. He is, as we sang, a good and gracious king. I think most of us know, don't we, from the scriptures that Jesus is all-powerful all and nothing is too hard for him. He is God the Son. He can do anything. We see him doing all these things in the scriptures. It's good for us to know that nothing is impossible for him because we face impossibilities and we need to know nothing is impossible for our Lord Jesus Christ. But we also need to know 
that he cares. He doesn't just have power. Because people have power on earth, but they don't care. There are missiles that are flying from Ukraine to Russia and Russia to Ukraine. That's a demonstration of power, but there's no care. There's the opposite. But our Lord Jesus is not only powerful, but he is full of compassion. He isn't just great, he is good. He isn't just mighty, he is merciful. He isn't just powerful in a general way, but he's personal in his care. This passage shows us his personal and individual care. For each individual we meet in this passage, from the crowd, that all the people who came to Peter's mother-in-law, he deals with each one personally. And he hasn't changed. When this church started in 1892, the Lord was compassionate to bring together a people here who loved him and loved his word and shone the gospel light into West Norwood. And of every single person who's come through those doors over those last 130 years, the Lord Jesus cares for. And he hasn't changed today. He cares for you. He knows you. He has saved you on the cross and he cares for you personally and individually. Whatever burden you're carrying today, whatever fears you face today, our Lord Jesus has authority and he has compassion. You can come running to him with your burdens today. Let's open up this text. First, I want to show you that the first verse confirms the, compassion, the, the authority of Jesus. If you look at verse 38, it says, And he arose and left the synagogue. Now, that word arose means he got up. He was sitting and he got up. When, he, when people taught in the synagogue in those days, they sat down to teach. Jesus taught, he dealt with the demon, and then he got up and went out. Now, why do I say that? Why, why is that important? I don't know if you ever come across people who, who seek to deal with spiritual forces now and are praying for people who are oppressed and whatever by demons. There's a lot of noise, a lot of shouting, a lot of standing up and stamping around trying to take authority. Jesus was sitting down to teach, and he simply spoke a word of authority to defeat the demon. There was no shouting, there was no stomping around. He was sitting down to teach, and simply by his word, he demonstrated his authority over the powers of darkness. I want to encourage you today. You may not be facing a demonic assault. You, you may feel under attack today. You may be facing any number of issues, spiritually, physically, emotionally. But if Jesus can simply sit down and say a word, and the demon is gone, that means whatever trouble you have in your life, a word from Jesus is enough. So lift your problem to him. He's no longer sitting in a synagogue. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And at the end of Matthew 28, and which will be our concluding verse to our service, it, he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Whatever you face, Jesus has authority. And those first few words in verse 38 confirm that. Just his word was enough. The second thing we see is Jesus' care in the home. Verse 38, he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now this is just a little aside 
is not the main point of this text at, at all, but just something that I reflected upon. These, these people, Jesus and his disciples, went to someone's home for after-church fellowship. They didn't just gather in the synagogue and then go to their separate homes. They met for fellowship after the morning service or after the even, afternoon service, whenever it was. We don't know. And I'm just, this is just an appeal for you to, to think and reflect on. When I became a Christian um, 35 years ago, I remember that often, not every week, but quite often, I would go to church and some would say, come back to mine. Let's come and have some dinner together. Let's have some fellowship together. Now, I know we don't, we, some of us have small flats, but we can offer a, a cup of tea and, and some cake or a sandwich and just spend some more time together than just simply being in this room on a Sunday morning. Fellowship. That's what's happening here. They're going for after-church fellowship. That's a good thing to strengthen the family of God. On the th Sabbath day, on the Lord's day for us as New Testament Christians, just have that time together. But out of that fellowship arose a need. Simon's mother-in-law, verse 38, was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. Now, in the previous verses in the synagogue, there was Jesus in his public ministry rebuking a demon and teaching. Here, without a big audience, there's no crowd to see it, Jesus ministers to this woman in her own home and brings healing. Can I ask you today, are there things going on in your home that you need the Lord Jesus to touch? Maybe a sickness, maybe your uh, utility bill is sitting on your, in your email account or on your table and the numbers aren't looking good. Maybe it's your child who you're concerned about. Maybe it's a neighbour who's troubling you. There's something going on that's affecting your home. And you may think, oh, well, Jesus is a bit too busy for that. He is not too busy for, Jesus, for Simon's mother-in-law. He's not too busy to go to that woman lying sick and very seriously ill. The word, the word ill suggests something that is gripping her and holding on to her. And a fever in those days could often end in death. It's a serious situation. And Jesus is not fearful of it. He walks into the place where the fever is and he again says the word and healing comes. But this shows his personal compassion. His compassion for an older woman. Often in, in, our, in our society, we, we complain about in-laws. <laughs> Here is Simon's mother-in-law and Jesus goes and ministers to her. In the home. Can I encourage you, this compassionate, powerful Lord Jesus, take whatever is troubling you in your home, in your circumstances, to him today, because he cares. And you want to know something else? But because Jesus has now finished his work on the earth and is now seated at God's right hand, he is also now present in your home by the Holy Spirit. You walk into your home and you're not alone in your home because he has come by his Spirit. He indwells you and your home. He is always with you and never will leave you nor forsake you. He cares about you in your home. And then the next thing we see in verse 39 is we see his authority over sickness. Notice there, verse 39, he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And that's the same word as in the previous section, 
where he rebuked the demon. And again, later on, uh, he does that in verse 41. Now, this doesn't mean that every sickness is a demon. It doesn't mean that at all, because there are, are, are examples in Scripture where sickness is a demon. He the demon. He doesn't rebuke a demon here. He rebukes the sickness. And the reason he does that is to show his authority over the human body and things that affect it. Later on in Luke, we see Jesus rebuking, same word again, the wind and the waves, to show his authority as God over creation and everything. So this word rebuke is simply saying Jesus has authority, complete and total authority over the human body and everything that affects it. And he hasn't changed. He has complete authority. So again, any situation that is affecting your body, sickness, enemy attack, storms of life, when you, you, you may not be sick, but you're feeling low and weighed down and troubled and broken, the Lord Jesus is sufficient and he has authority to come and help you. And then he demonstrates the authority. Notice at the end of verse 39, it left her and she spent two weeks recuperating. Does it say that? What does it say? It left her and what? Immediately she rose and began to serve. Now, again, we see in other scriptures, Jesus heals in a different way. It was a man that Jesus healed in stages. He said, I see men like trees walking around. You didn't see fully the first time Jesus touched him. Even today, Jesus will often heal in stages. But just because that's what we're used to doesn't mean we should expect it, that, that stages is going to happen all the time. He is able to change the situation just like that. Just with a word. Just in one moment. He's able to save someone in just a mo one moment. I was sharing at the meeting with someone last night that, that, that when I was converted back in 1989, the night I heard the gospel for the first time, someone gave me their Bible uh, to loan me their Bible until I got my own. And I went back to my room and I started at Matthew chapter 1. I read halfway through Luke before I fell asleep. And the next morning I was up again reading the Bible. And my life was turned around in an instant. Now, not everyone's conversion story is the same. But I thank God, because that was one of the, the verses I read early on in my Christian life. I knew God had done something in my life even though I didn't have the full language to explain how I was saved and all of that, I knew that God had done something because there was an immediate change in my life. Let's pray for that. Maybe there are people in your life you're thinking, will they ever be saved? Will they ever be changed? Maybe there is a long-term sickness in your situation and we need to thank God that he often uses gradual means of our bodies and doctors and so on, but he is able to change it in an instant. He's able to save your kids in an instant. He's able to build this church in an instant because he has the authority to do that. But fourthly, Jesus' authority calls for a response. Immediately, she rose up and began to serve them. He began to serve them. She didn't just say, oh, thank you, Jesus, I'll go and get on with my life now. She began to serve. This should surely be the response to the touch of the Lord Jesus upon our life. Firstly, in salvation. Jesus, I want to serve you. Jesus, I want to tell people about you. Jesus, I want to worship you. Jesus, I want to express my love for you. Jesus, I want to follow you and become like you. Impurity is uh, uh, and, and obedience to your Father in heaven. Service is a normal response. Jesus, I owe you my life. 
And I know for myself, and I've seen it many times, God answers prayer for someone, and they thank the Lord, and then they go back to the way it was before. Even Christians. Thanking the Lord, yeah, praise God, I'm better now, I've been healed. There's no change. There's no moving forward in the things of God. Let Peter's mother-in-law be an example to us. She started serving. That's how he respond to the compassionate Jesus. Jesus, I want to serve you. Fifthly, Jesus' compassionate authority means we can bring people to him. So far, it was just one person, Simon's mother-in-law. They, brought, they, they told Jesus, and Jesus went with compassion, not looking for a crowd, just went privately and administered life to her. But then it says in verse 40, the sun was setting. And that simply means it was the end of the Sabbath. So because of the end of the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath day they weren't allowed to carry anybody, they didn't bring their sick carrying them on the Sabbath. They waited till sunset when the Sabbath was over and then brought the people to Jesus. This news of his deliverance in the synagogue brought a crowd. And notice it, was, it says there, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. So these were people that couldn't bring themselves. And their friends and their family brought them to Jesus. Now, we're not restricted by a Sabbath day. We're not restricted by a place or a location. Jesus is here. Jesus is with us by his Spirit. And so at any time, at any place, we can bring people to Jesus. And I want to encourage you, because there are people, I know the people in my own family, who don't pray for themselves, who won't pray for themselves. But I know that I can bring them to Jesus. There are people in your family, be it they are physically sick, mentally unwell, or that they are away from the Lord, and they won't or can't pray for themselves, but you can bring them to the compassionate Lord Jesus Christ. You can carry them, as it were, in your prayers to the throne of grace, where seated there is the good and gracious King. You can pray. You can bring them. And notice the way verse 40 is written. I just, I'll, I'll read it again, emphasizing certain words. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. This is telling us that there is no restriction on who we can bring to Jesus. All, any, there's no situation that is beyond Jesus. It says various diseases. Nothing is beyond him. Rich or poor, young or old, even because of the location of Capernaum, probably Jew and Gentile as well. Anybody can come with any trouble and bring them to Jesus. That is his care and compassion for us. And for those that we bring, he is sufficient for them. And I know that some of you have been praying for years for loved ones. Keep bringing them, because he is able. Let Jesus in this passage, ministering to all these people, Matthew and Mark tell us that there's a large crowd. There were many, many people brought to Jesus. 
But see this, and this is a sick thing. See that Jesus deals with each one personally. Notice it, the passage does not say, verse 40 does not say, Jesus stood at the front of the crowd and commanded healing from a distance. It says he laid his hands on every one of them. Isn't that precious? That's a personal touch. He had the authority to just rebuke them all from a distance. But he laid his hands on every one. And you know, that shows us that Jesus cares for every single one of us. Because he hasn't changed. He is still compassionate to you. Personally. Yes, to the whole church. Yes, he loves his people at Lansdowne, but he also loves you. He cares for you. So much so that in his glorious grace, he touches each one of us personally. Do you think to yourself, I'm just a face in the crowd? I'm just a little Christian trying to be a good Christian, trying to do things right and honor God with my life. I'm not that important. Well, each one of this crowd was important enough to Jesus for him to lay hands on them personally. And you are important enough for Jesus that he died for you upon the cross. He died for your sins, not just the sins of the world, but your sins upon the cross. He carried the iniquities of his lost sheep upon the cross. He cared for you personally to die for you. And he still ever lives to intercede for you. He still cares for you now. You are not in a, a face in the crowd. It says in the parable of the, 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 the good shepherd, John 10, 13, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. It's not just we know him, but I know my sheep. Now, if you have been looking at sheep, when you go on holiday, you look at sheep, they all look the same to me. Some might be slightly bigger or smaller, but they all basically look the same. But he knows his sheep. We may think, oh, we might get all the same in a big crowd that Jesus loves. No, he knows you personally. That him put it poetically, that it is my name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. He cares for you. So whether you feel alone or distant or too small for him, look afresh at your Saviour who touched each one. He cares for you. He cares for me. And then finally, see the fulfilment of God's precious promises in Jesus. We see again another encounter with demons. This time there's more than one demon because more people have been brought to him. Now the same issue that we had in the synagogue in the previous section where the demons begin to tell who Jesus is and he rebukes them and silences them. And we said last time the, the demons, Jesus had a plan to reveal himself in his own time who he really was. And the demons want to cause trouble by bringing that revelation too soon. As a challenge to us, do not let the devil lead us too quickly. Often we're tempted to be apathetic and go too slowly, but especially if our personality is more get up and go, we can run ahead of God. Let's wait for his leading. But also, what Jesus is doing here is he's making sure the revelation of himself comes from him and not from them. They, that the people would trust Jesus for revelation and not rely on the enemy. And that's important for us today because there are false teachers who say true things. We think, oh, they're okay because they say true things. But they're actually not true teachers. 
I mean, to get the truth from Scripture, he is our authority. And even what, is, what I preach on a Sunday, or Lawrence, or, or, or Ken, or anybody else preaches on a Sunday, if it doesn't check out, then don't believe it. Check out according to Scripture. So Jesus wanted to ensure that the revelation came from him. But I said this is a fulfillment. Remember a few weeks ago when we were looking at Jesus in Nazareth and he read from Isaiah 61, and you can find this in, in Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring, proclaim good news to the poor. He's doing that. He's preaching the word. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. He's sending people free from demons. Recovering of sight to the blind. People are being healed. He said at liberty those who are oppressed. Everything that, is, that people need to be set free from, he's coming and setting them free from it. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus is who he claims to be. He's also the fulfiller of Isaiah 53. The one who was led like a lamb to the slaughter and slain for our sins. He's a fulfiller of every promise that God has made. And the reason I highlight that for you is to tell you there's nobody else who can save you. Only Jesus fulfilled it. Only Jesus meets what the Bible says. Only Jesus is God the Son. Only Jesus fulfills the promises. Only Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Only Jesus defeated death. Only Jesus has the authority to save you when you call upon him. Only Jesus has the authority to guard you and keep you and lead you through life, through all the troubles. Only Jesus has the compassion to strengthen you and care for you. Even other people that care for us, they fail us. But Jesus will never fail us. He is a compassionate and authoritative saviour who will keep you to the end. And that is why, if you're not a Christian, you need to trust him. And don't just trust him, as it were, and, and be, be like the opposite of, of Peter's mother-in-law. Yes, I believe, and then nothing changes. But just give your whole life to him. Because he is the all-sufficient saviour. And these healings deliver then the there and now, but they're also signs of what's to come. They're signs of Revelation 21, verse 4. There's no sickness or mourning or sorrow or pain. There are also signs of salvation because sickness came into the world because of sin. And as he deals with these people and he heals them, he's showing he's come not, to just, to, he's come not just to save from sickness, but to save from sin. And he did that on the cross. At the same time, we can come to Jesus today with whatever trouble we have. If it's sickness, he's sufficient. If it's sorrow, he's sufficient. If it's loneliness, he's sufficient. If it's fear, he's sufficient. If it's concern for our unsaved family and friends, he is sufficient to save them. We can come to him. And he is compassionate to carry you, to draw alongside you, and to touch your life. As you go into this new week, and as you approach the busyness of this Christmas season, we can be tempted in our busyness to think that Jesus is too busy. He's not. He's not like us. He's all sufficient. He's human like us and also God. So he's touched and he knows how we feel. He walked this earth. He's perfect. And he is all sufficient. So in the midst of your busyness, in the midst of your burdens, look up, good and gracious King, seated at the right hand of the Father, who's interceding for you, who cares for you, 
who is with you by his spirit, and he is enough, and he has compassion and care for you, to lead you, to deliver you, encourage you, to refresh you, to heal you, to provide for you, to strengthen you. Our sufficient and our loving, compassionate Saviour. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that he cares for us. Thank you that he is perfect in every single way. Lord, forgive us that we often think that just because we're busy that perhaps you don't care either. But Lord, you do care. And you are sufficient and compassionate for us. Lord, would you come now and encourage us with these things. In Jesus' name, amen.